structure and the meaning or behavior of these programs, we're going to need some way of modeling that or representing that. And so we can ask ourselves, what sorts of models could we use? Well, if you're given a program, one common way that you'll be given it is as a compiled binary. Right? This is how you get a lot of programs. Probably download them and you run them. And so you've got this compiled binary. This isn't easy to work with. So in the compilation process, where you're taking the, the behavior of a program and lowering it down to a binary executable, you lose a lot of information. The semantics are stripped out of the program. And it's actually difficult, as this says, to even separate in that binary what is data, so say values for constants inside your program, versus what is actual executable code. That in general, is provably impossible, like most interesting problems are. And if you can't even figure out what's code and what's data, it's probably not that easy to analyze. So we want something a little bit more useful. Well, we can look at the source code then, right? That's the other extreme. But it's not that easy to just analyze a bunch of text and extract interesting information from it. Now, that doesn't mean it's impossible. There's a lot of good program analysis that's just emerging now based on natural language processing of source code. But uh, it doesn't dig as in-depth into the meaning of the code. Usually, it's more tied to things like understanding comments or something along those lines. And it's very, very language specific. So you can't write your analysis and have it apply across a bunch of different languages. So what can we use instead? Any suggestions? Software developer. <clears throat> um, pardon me? Software developer. <laughs> you could use a software developer. OK, the software developer has information about the program, but they're maybe not a good model for automated analysis, uh, unless you have some brain interface for them, which you know, it's emerging. It's emerging. Um, that there is actually a lot of weird research going on that's producing very interesting results on things like eye tracking movement for developers to infer things about programs because of that, uh, and other behavioral things based on software developers. But ideally, something about the program, because even if we use the software developer as a model, their understanding is still human, and so their understanding is flawed, inherently flawed, right? So how many people have taken a compiler's course? Intermediate language. Intermediate language. The like JBA compiler com converts to the. Okay. Yeah, so basically all lang all uh, compilers have a, a way in which different languages are being processed and they convert it to an intermediate language. Sure. Which a compiler does. So th there's oh. this notion of a compiler taking the source code and then transforming it yeah. through a parsing process into some other representations that are more universal. I like this. In fact, you'll find a lot of the stuff that happens in this course is going to be based on compilers' techniques. Uh, in fact, I'm, in a sense, a compiler's person. It's just I don't care about things like parsing. I don't really care about things like code generation. I care about analyzing the code in that intermediate form. Trace is also. Uh, yeah, I mean. Yes, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, so uh, right now, I've only started talking about what we call static techniques. Right. Uh, a trace is more of a dynamic representation. We're going to come back to that. Um, we should come back to that. Do we have a clock? Yes. We should come back to that later today, because we've got an hour and a half left. So great. Um, but these are, are kind of our core starting representations that we're going to look at. So we've got things like abstract syntax trees, control flow graphs. These are things that if you've worked with compilers before, you're probably familiar with. Or you're at least familiar with the first one. And hopefully you're familiar with the second one, if you've worked with compilers before. Maybe not. How, uh, did, I, did I get a show of hands on how many people had taken a compiler's course? OK. Did you deal most with, mostly with parsing? I read like theory, practical part of the first one. Not the OK, OK. So, so, so analyzing this one is probably probably going to be new, but that's good. That's good. Okay, so let's start off with this. Abstract syntax trees are just a way of representing that 
uh, structure of the code in a slightly more universal fashion. So you've got internal nodes that represent these different sorts of operations that can happen, and these external nodes that represent uh, variables, values, any sort of operand inside the program. So you can see, well, we've got a for loop over here, and this for loop contains well, an operand i. It has a range, and that range has two operands, 5 and 10. And the for loop has a body, right? And this body contains a statement, which is an assignment uh, to what? a sub i, and it's assigning the value i times 5, right? So you can see this structure here. Anybody, anybody see any problems with this? Is this good enough? What about my complaints that I had before? How can you say that the bracket is, it says a bracket of i and it doesn't say i bracket of a? No. Uh, so, so usually so ordering is important. So, so when you look at these representations, a lot of the times you'll say things like, the left child is the left operand. Uh, left operand. Um, so it's it's not it's not mm -hmm. extremely abstract. It's it's an engineering abstraction, right? Where where ordering is very important. Um, what complaints did I have before? What complaints did I have about source code? Language specific. Yeah, very language specific. ASTs are still very, very language specific, right? Because all the different operations that you can do, and even what types of operands you can have, are all going to be dependent on the language. So this isn't very universal yet. And it doesn't capture the meaning of the code very well. It captures the structure very well, right? It captures the lexical structure. Um, lexical being essentially the, the layout of source code, right? It doesn't capture the meaning. So this is why we want to go one step further and look at things like control flow graphs. And you might have seen these either in compilers or software engineering courses before. This is just showing the possible decisions and paths through a program, right? So we have a small snippet of code over here, take some condition from the input, and if the condition is true, you do one thing, if the condition is false, you do another. And we can represent that with uh, a node that contains the decision. And then if you take the true branch, you go over here. You take the false branch, you go over here. And they merge together at the end. Right? So you're just representing the behavior of the program. We have basic blocks in here, which have straight line code. Right? There are no decisions made in between these instructions. So we smush them together. It just makes things simpler and easier to analyze. It actually has big efficiency implications as well. It's not really important. We have edges, which show how decisions can affect the flow of control through a program. Right? We took true here, so it went to this branch. And we have paths, which show the potential ways that the program can execute. Right? You could take the true branch here and come down, merge at the end, and that's showing the entire flow of execution for the snippet of code. Pretty remedial at this point, right? Pretty straightforward. Okay. So you can notice here that the language specific features are gone. Right? We no longer have a while, and while statements don't exist necessarily in every language. You could, you could have some other syntax. You could have a, a loop statement or a for statement or something like that. So if we look over here, we have sum equals zero, i equals one, while. This should be while uh, i is less than n, not while 1 is less than n, because that's not so useful. Um, we'll come through here and increment i and add this to a sum, right? This is summing up numbers, I guess, 1 through n-ish, n minus 1-ish or something. Uh, it doesn't really matter. OK. Why is the if in a different block? Is uh, there's a edge toward it? Yeah, yeah. So this is no longer a single sequence of characters that can be reasoned about independently. There's a separate edge into this decision, so it needs to be separated out. This allows us to reason about these things in a modular fashion. Right? Just a way of simplifying things. Um, 
Okay, so control flow graphs, everybody comfortable? Good. Okay. Now we're going to start to get a little bit more interesting. Suppose that we have two instructions, x and y. We can say that x depends on y if y can influence x in some fashion. And the way in which it can influence x could be pretty flexible. We're going to talk about two ways of uh, y influencing x. But there are actually others. So it can get more complex than we're going to talk about. Uh, but this is going to be a most common representation. It's called a program dependence graph. We have nodes representing the instructions, or basic blocks, but generally instructions. And we'll have an edge from y to x showing that y can influence x. We're going to have two main types of influence. These are data dependence and control dependence. When we talk about data dependence, this is pretty straightforward, I think. We can say that x data depends on y if there is a path from y to x in the control flow graph. And a variable or value definition of y uh, at y is used at x. So essentially that's saying a value flows from one statement in a program to another. Right? You're using a value computed here, down here. Pretty straightforward intuition. But we want to be rigorous in terms of reasoning about this. So is this a, is this a data dependence? No. Why? Well, you just assign x to some function, right? OK, yes. I would say we're, we're assigning some value to x. Does, does this value of x data depend on that one? No. Ah. No. 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 I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm hearing a few different things. Let's, yeah. let's hear some justification. There are data dependencies here. Why? Because uh, there's an assignment, and the, in the next one, uh, that variable is used for assigning to another. Sure. So, so intuitively, we're using this value here. Ah, so you refer to lines three and four, not just lines line three. Oh yes, yes. So, like so it's I'm, not very I'm, clear. I'm, I'm asking if, if this this arrow represents a valid data dependence. So it's just sorry. like to dr drag our attention to this. Oh 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 sorry sorry yes um or rather no um <laughs> I'm asking whether or not this reflects a valid data dependence essentially. Oh okay. Okay, that does clarify things then. Okay, so I would say this is a valid data dependence because we're using this value here. Is this a valid data dependence? No. Why? Because in both the intermediate phases, x is getting a different value. Okay, so we're redefining x. We're not actually using the value computed up here, down here. We're using one of these two. I agree with that. So that's not a valid data dependence. Now let's look at these. Are these valid data dependencies? Let's, let's first consider this one over here. Is Pot that a valid data dependence? Yes. Potentially. OK, I hear potentially and I hear Maybe. yes. Maybe. It depends upon which path that we take. OK. And I would say that because we're reasoning about this static program, we don't know which path could be taken. So yes. The answer is yes, because if there may be a dependence, then there is a dependence. It may or may not be exercised in a particular execution, but we'll talk about that when we start to talk about traces and dynamic analyses. Right now, we're just reasoning about the static program. There's a potential dependence, so there is a dependence. Um, and with this one, well, yeah. Right? Well, it, it should be, right? Value of y used right there. So depending on which path you take, you'll use a different value, but that's OK. Notice then, this data depends on two different things. It doesn't mean it's getting two different definitions, because which definition it gets is going to be different depending on the execution, but it's going to potentially depend on either of those. OK, so these are our data dependencies there. Okay, so that's that's describing data dependence. You're using a value. There's something else that's 
a little more painful, a little more subtle, uh, but it's really, really useful. It's this control dependence. So we can't talk about control dependence without talking about a few other things first. And this is where we're going to start to talk about properties of control flow graphs. Properties of graphs in general, really. These same, uh, these same properties will hold even if, if you want to reason about other types of graphs. They're still very, very useful. So we're going to start by talking about dominators. X dominates Y if every path from the entry node of a program or a snippet or whatever you're reasoning about to Y passes X. Uh, if every path right, uh, passes X. So we also have notions of strict, normal, and immediate dominance. We'll talk about those in a moment. Does anybody have see if oh anybody have an intuition for what this means? So like every statement, there is no if or any any statement between x and y. And up, so say after x, if if y comes just after x, and f is and there is no if or else statement. <laughs> There are plenty of markers here. Oh, oh, brilliant. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, oh, we have boards on multiple walls. This is well, it's more of a classroom really than a lecture hall, right? So yeah, well, I mean, that's part of right? Huh. I'll take it. I'll take it. Um, OK. So what you're saying is I have uh, x, and yeah. I've got y. And there's no if statement between them? Then then there is one case where it dominates. It dominates y. OK, that is one case. One case. The yeah. other case would be, like, even if there is a branch, if they merge together in the end. OK, OK. Even so, then it would work. So and erasers. <laughs> yes. Excellent. Multiple erasers. Excellent. <laughs> um, So if we have x up here, it could still branch as long as it merges together. Yeah. So x still dominates by default. Right. So informally, what we're saying is that if you execute y, you know you executed x. Right. You must have, right? No matter what. The structure in between could be pretty much arbitrary. But if you executed y, you know that you executed x. And we talk about relationships between two things. So we're basically talking about set relationships here, general notion of relations. What do things like strict, normal, and immediate mean? Any idea? What, what is a strict relationship in set theory? Or, or like, uh, like less than, uh, that's subset. It is definitely a subset. Right, right. So it's it's not equal to. Right. So we have a strict dominance means that well x is x dominates y and it's not y. Right. Um, and in general, normal dominance could be well x dominates y. Y also dominates itself because if you executed y, you must have executed y. Right. Pretty straightforward. There's also a notion of immediate dominance which is the first predecessor backward is that must that you must have executed. So in this case, x is the immediate dominator, yes. But let's say that we had z. Well, in this case, x is not an immediate dominator of z, right? But y is. Because it's the first thing backward that does dominate y, uh, does dominate z. Okay. Yeah, so then if we look at um, node 6 down here, what are the dominators of 6? 1, 2. OK, 1, 2, and 3. What, what is the immediate dominator of 6? And there's only ever 1. 3. 3. OK, so I almost agree, right? Remember that a node dominates itself. Yeah. So 1, 2, 3, and 6 are the dominators of 6. And I agree the immediate dominator of 6 is 3. Well done. OK. And we already said what it means intuitively. Um, we also have post-dominance. 
Any guess as to what this is? Just the opposite. Just the opposite. So, yeah, it's every path from y to the exit passes x. So if you execute y, you will guaranteed execute x. Reasonable? Yeah. Okay. So what are the post dominators of five? Four, six, five, B. B, sorry. Okay. B, six, and five. And five. Okay. And what is the immediate post dominator of five? Three. 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 Okay. I agree. Nice. And we already talked about what this means intuitively, essentially. It just means you must execute it. Yeah, okay. So now we get to finally talk about control dependence. It's weird that we talk about these paths that you must take through a, a program in order to start to talk about whether something controls something else. But that's, that's the nature of things. There are a few different definitions here. There's a formal definition, and there's an intuitive definition. We'll go through both. So the formal definition, or no, this is the, the intuitive definition. Uh, if x directly decides whether or not y executes, then y control depends on x. That makes sense, right? That's fairly intuitive. This means x determines whether you execute y, just like it says. Formally, it's a bit messy. There exists a path from x to y such that y post dominates every node between x and y. And y does not strictly post dominate x. This is more complicated. If you're implementing it, however, then you'll want to actually use this definition, because this is ad hoc, right? It's intuitive, but it's not very useful when you're implementing something. So what does this actually mean? Well, there exists a path from x to y so we have this, right, such that y post dominates every node between x and y. What does that mean? Well, if there is a node between them, then it doesn't branch off. That's all that's saying. Right? So I think this is a nice illustration of what that means. It's easier than the actual definition. And y does not strictly post dominate x. What's that saying? It's not right. Um, X might go X south. Might do it. Yeah, it, it means that X could go somewhere else. You could skip it, you, or you could skip Y. That's all it's saying. So those are your criteria. You must be able to skip Y from X, and if you, you do take this branch, then you must execute Y. Okay, so essentially what this is formalizing again is that X directly controls whether or not you will execute Y. So this gives you a notion of the meaning, right? You can start to infer that some decision at X is very, very relevant. It influences the behavior of the program by determining whether or not you execute Y. Okay, so what are the control dependencies of five? Three. Three? Okay. What are the control dependencies of three? Two. One, two. One, two. Okay. Oh, do I not have the answer? Oh. So I will say the control dependencies of five is the set containing three. I agree with that, right? Because three directly determines whether or not five executes. Control dependencies of three, well, you'll always execute it at least once, but we have this other path from five to three, but then again, it does post dominate it. Technically, most of the time, you will say uh, three control depends upon itself, because three does actually determine whether or not it executes in a future iteration. One of these nasty uh, issues where back edges come into play. Okay. Um, and using this logic, what are the control dependencies of seven? Okay. I 
hear three, I hear four. Do I hear anything else? Can we hear some reasoning? Directly, contro directly controls whether or not the name is used Aha. I will say, though, that when we come down to 7, there's a node that can yeah. branch somewhere else. Yeah. So we can skip it. So, okay. Or it's on the fence. I would, I would go one lower than, say, five, five. But the block containing four. Right. 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 Yeah. So. Um, but I would say, I would say this, this controls it. Yeah. OK. Um, what are the control dependencies of two? I'm probably trying to trick you. You have to break up the if statement. Aha! You have to break up the if statement. If we have something that short circuits like this, x or y. Is that short circuit though? Or? Uh, as Python, okay. yes, okay. technically. Um, okay, I guess I can't assume everybody knows Python. This is true. It's short circuits. <laughs> okay. Um, so this means that the syntax of the code is misleading. This is one of the reasons why you want a representation that reflects the actual behavior a little bit better. We have to break this up and say, well, we have one A and one B, and both of those could go to two. Okay, if you take this branch, well then x directly determines whether or not 2 executes. And if you're here and you take this branch, then this directly determines whether or not 2 executes. Uh, so you could say they both do. But they're independent. Right? They independently do so. So the program dependence graph is just a combination of these two things that we've spent. Okay, we've still got reasonable time spent a fair bit of time talking about. Um, the, the control dependence graph and the data dependence graph. And this is just showing notions of influence, right? So if you want to start to reason about the ways in which one part of a program can affect another, program dependence graph is really, really useful. There are other types of influence, though. You can have things like timing-based influence, um, which is somewhat pathological. And there are even other things like energy usage influence, which can come into play as well. All of these things uh, deal with slightly more advanced notions of program defense graphs than we're necessarily going to start with in that at least. Okay, so we've got potential influence. This means we're useful for things like debugging, what caused a bug for security. Can some security sensitive information leak? Right? You can track back all of these influences, influences to see if you can leak bits of secure information uh, through these dependencies. You can look at things like testing. Can I or how can I reach a particular statement? OK. That's enough for program dependence graph. We're going to dive a whole lot more into that in a bit when we start talking about ways of using them. So now let's move on to a different representation, the call graph. How many of you have used the call graph before? Nobody. Okay. Call graphs can be really, really useful. They represent the structure of a program at a somewhat higher level. In fact, I might have expected that you might have seen some of these in an IDE. Because you can generate these sorts of things with a lot of Java IDE. Doxygen generates if you want. Yes, yes. Doxygen can generate, uh, well, Doxygen can generate not only call graphs, but things like interaction diagrams, all sorts of crazy stuff. But yes, it can generate call graphs. Um, it's just showing which functions call which other functions, really. Right? That's it. So you have nodes, which are the functions, or sometimes call sites within those functions. And then you have edges that show the possible calls. So we have foo, and it can call bar and baz. And we have bar, and it calls bam. Uh, we don't really have a big vocabulary. What is this capture? One function calls another, and it might call uh, recursion. Recursion. It captures recursion, yeah, and it captures a particular type of recursion, no less, right? Mutual recursion. 
where you've got one thing calling another which calls the original. So mutual recursion. Uh, in general, cycles are a pain. They make everything tougher. But it's good to be able to recognize where cycles exist inside the composition and structure of your program. Call graph can be very useful for that. Control flow graph is useful for identifying loops that do that. Call graph identifies these recursive contexts. OK. How should we handle function pointers? Any, well, everybody know what a function pointer is? OK, good. Or you know, virtual functions, or, or any sort of polymorphic invocation there. How should we handle them in a call graph? Any ideas? Uh, it's something that can come, uh, have several arrows to it, maybe, potentially. I, 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 would, I would say you're absolutely on the right track, but I would reverse the way that you phrased it. Um, so a function pointer is essentially, um, it represents many possible functions. So it means when you call through a function pointer, there are many possible outgoing arrows from that, uh, that call site. So whatever, whatever function calls through a function pointer is going to have many potential outgoing edges. Now again, you may not execute all of them during a single execution. You might only use one of them. So they all represent these potential uh, calls that exist inside the program. This will be very, very relevant to your project because it's basically what you're doing for your project. Um, a little more complicated, not a whole lot more in my opinion. Hopefully. Shouldn't be that bad. Okay. So this kind of gets us into something else. In general, pointers are a big problem. So we saw just a moment ago that pointers create this situation where one variable can actually point to many different variables. And if you're reasoning about how a program behaves. And it's really important that you be able to figure out just what those potential variables are, those potential things you're pointing to actually are. Because if you don't know what a pointer is pointing to, then your program could be doing anything, basically, right? I mean, maybe maybe your pointer points to zero, uh, in which case you, know, you, you try and dereference it, and your program crashes, right? It's a good thing to know. So, Pointers are very, very problematic. And it's not just um, the one problem we, we just saw. In general, we have aliasing, where multiple variables could point to the same thing. And we also have ambiguity. So one variable may potentially denote several different targets in memory. Now, aliasing is problematic because if I have a pointer, if I have two pointers that point to the same thing, and I modify that thing through one pointer, and I use that thing through the other pointer, then there's a dependence between them, right? There's a data dependence between them. But if they point to different things, there's no data dependence. So being able to figure out whether or not they can point to the same thing is important, or even figuring out when they point to the same thing can be important. Although that's actually very, very hard. Um, again, technically undecidable. Uh, technically impossible. Okay. Not using formal language there. Okay. And ambiguity creates this situation again where you just have this explosion of the potential behaviors, right? If one pointer could point to anything in memory, then your list of potential behaviors is expansive, difficult to deal with. So just showing what this, this can imply. So if you have x dot lock and y dot unlock, oh, maybe this represents a safe behavior. If you can guarantee that x and y point to the same lock, then you're locking it here, you're releasing it there, and that's great. If they point to different things and you never locked what you're unlocking down here, it's probably not a correct behavior, right? And you're never unlocking this. So that's probably problematic too. At the same point over here, we can see a use in the context of security. If Y and X can alias, if they may alias, 
then you could be leaking a password. You could be broadcasting a password over a network. It's a bad idea. So understanding these aliasing relationships is important. So in order to represent this, we often use something called a points to graph. Um, and the relation here is where we say, well, you've got a relation px where p either may or must point to x. And you actually want to keep track of which type of relationship it is. You want to know if p must point to x, which confines the potential behaviors of your program greatly, right? Or if it simply may point to x, in which case you'll be conservative and say, oh, I don't really know, but I have to take this into account. So if we have a program over here, right, we can have r, which points to c, and then if I say p.f equals r, and I can have this sort of represent representation. I've got something for p, and its f field points to r, right? And if I say then t equals c, um, c is a constructor, um, and I make a new node for it, and then if some condition, q equals p, that means it's may alias, not guaranteed. So we have a different arrow here, but q may point to p. Uh, and then at the end, we have r.f points to t. So we can represent all of the relationships here. Having a, some structure like this allows you to determine whether or not two things point to the same, uh, same object in memory. And this allows your analysis to be more precise. OK, so we can see from this that p.f.f must always be the same as t, right? Because we have these strict must relationships there. And we have q may alias p. Clearly represented inside the graph. This isn't the only representation you'll see for pointer analysis. In general, again, pointer analysis alone is impossible to do precisely, provably impossible to do precisely. And so the question of what sorts of compromises you'll make when you might add in maybe some extra may arrows that don't necessarily need to be there or something along those lines can affect your representation and how easy it is to compute, various things of that nature. Okay, so we've talked so far about these static representations of programs, where you have the program by itself. Now we can start to talk about the dynamic representations as mentioned earlier. So static representations look at all program behaviors at once. In so doing, you lose something. You're, you're conservative, right? You're saying, I'm looking at all the possible behaviors of this program, and you're mixing them together a little bit. As you mix them together in your representation, you start to form what's called an over-approximation. And we'll, we'll see more how that works. We'll see a lot more how that works over the course of the semester. Um, and they're usually projected onto the control flow graph. So you might notice you know, if you have one program that executes a loop twice versus one program that executes a loop three times, they may behave differently. But you're projecting them onto the same control flow graph and combining the information across these runs. Right? In contrast, we can have an execution representation which captures the dynamic behavior of just one single real execution. And so you're going to be very, very precise, but you're only going to reason about one execution. And if you have multiple instances of an instruction that occur inside an execution, that's going to occur multiple times. And so the most canonical representation of this is a trace. And there are various forms of traces. Here's a control flow trace. So you can see that this represents a path through the program, right? We have one, two, three, and then we execute the body of the loop, and we hit three. We execute the body of the loop again, and we exit. So we're executing the loop twice, the body of the loop twice. That's just one single execution. There's several different ways of representing this. All of these are equivalent. You could list every single instruction with an instance count, right? Uh, or you could just represent every basic block with its instance count. Or you could just list the decisions you made, true, true, false. All of those are equivalent in terms of representing the control flow of the program. 
Now, control flow traces aren't the only types of traces. You could have data flow traces and other things along those lines as well, but they start to get a lot more complex, as you'll see in a moment. Well, as you'll see in several moments. Okay. So, in addition to traces, we have what's called a dynamic dependence graph. We talked about a normal program dependence graph, right? Where you're looking at all these dependencies inside a program. Well, now we can look at those same dependencies, but inside this trace representation. So there's a dependence between two instructions if one dynamic instruction may influence another. And this means that instead of saying, well, three may depend upon itself, which we saw before, and you see this self loop, well, maybe different instances of three inside a trace, and you'll just depend on a previous one. There should be no cycles in a dynamic dependence graph, because you'll always depend on something that has already occurred. Okay, so we can see here through the first iteration of the loop, we have, oh, we have sum equals zero, we have i equals one. I got the i correct here, I don't know why it was one before. If i is less than n, i equals i plus one, and sum equals sum plus i. You can see the control dependencies over here, and you can see the data dependencies over here. And if we execute another iteration of the loop, well, first we execute the condition again, and we can add in a dependence on i, and notice that we're depending on the i inside the body of the loop, or more precise, we don't have to depend on i at the beginning. And uh, we're control dependent on the previous decision. And then you can see another, another instance of the loop, and then we go all the way down to the end where you're uh, data dependent on the sum computed at the end, right? This is messy, right? This is really, really tough to sift through. Uh, that's the nature of dynamic dependence graphs. They get kind of large. So yeah, this is difficult for people to work through. And so the next group of slides that we're going to look at, uh, next slide deck, whatever, whatever you want to call it, is actually going to deal with ways of wading through this meaningfully as one of the core techniques. So yes, I guess I guess that's next. Okay, yes. So we're going to look at using these program dependence graphs. And